sense, what are some of those key drivers that uh, fundamentally drive the real estate sector? Yeah, yeah, um, that's that's a very good question. Thank you for that. Um, there's quite a number of them, um, but then I'll just like pick out um, just a few main ones. San Benani Dumelang, good evening and welcome to episode 449 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzamandungwa Kumalo. It's the Friday edition of the Private Property Podcast. If you join us for the first time, welcome to the family. You tuned into the leading podcast in all things property right here in South Africa. And to all our regular viewers, our top fan gang members, and of course, the many of you who share our live and certainly tag your friends and families, welcome to it you know how we do every single weekday you and i have an appointment where every single uh, evening i am in conversation with a property expert who helps us navigate and make better property decisions that's exactly what we're going to be doing this evening uh, and of course as we look at investment on the lower end of the housing market and to help us get a sense of you know what investing in that sector is like how it works some of the drivers what we need to look forward to i'm joined by by Luda Luchabem, who is a research manager at the Center for, for Affordable Housing uh, Finance in Africa. Luda, good evening, and thank you so much for joining us on the show. Good evening, Zama, and thank you for having me. This is, this is great. I'm looking forward to having this chat. It's so great to, to have you on the show. I know it's the first time we're speaking to you, spoken to some of your great colleagues on the show, and it's always so great you know, speaking to them because it, it, I, I always say whenever we speak to somebody from CAF that this is one of those... Uh, um, subjects that I particularly like because we, we we don't explore it sufficiently, and also the nerd in me enjoys this. I mean, I I'm, I'm doing a master's in property development and management, so it, it's always great speaking to people who uh, who research this and of course produce the data. I hate having to get the data and get it in its raw form and clean it up. I hate that part. So I, I like the work that CAF does because then we get all the, the, the nice stuff. We get the good reports. We've done all the grunt work and, of course, package it for us uh, in a really great way. And I think that probably leads us straight into our conversation. I mean, when you look, when you talk about uh, the lower end market, firstly, which what's the price points that we're, we're talking about, just so viewers are aware, because I know that the way CAF defines the different um, price points or the different classifications, if you call it that, isn't quite the way we, we define it, I'll say in mainstream media. So in mainstream media, your lower end property is your entry level, they'll say it's something like 700,000. And you and I both know that that's actually not uh, the lower end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's very right. Uh, we're constantly having these negotiations with developers um, on what uh, on how to define what the lower end of the market is. But at CAF, we've actually broken down the market into five different market segments. Um, the first one being the lowest one, which is the entry market segment. And these are uh, houses or units um, that are worth between zero to 300,000 rand. And then there's the affordable market segment, which is units between 300 and 600,000 rand. We also have the conventional market. Um, those are units between 600,000 to 900,000 rand. And we have the high end market between 900 and um, 1.2 million. And lastly, we have the luxury market, which we have um, designated as anything um, over 1.2 million rand. So that's how we've kind of defined what affordable housing is. So anything less than 600,000 rand falls within the affordable housing market segment at CAF. But this is, it's quite subjective. You know, we get a lot of developers that disagree with that. But I think um, with the work that we do on the ground, we can firmly say that, um, yeah, anything above 600,000 is for the most part um, not affordable to a great many people within the country. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, the, the big thing is we do, I see why developers would want to uh, contest 
your your definitions <laughs> and, and we won't go we yeah. won't go into it uh but i but i know why because i think a, a number of developers uh would argue that some of their developments for instance cater for the lower end and yet it's not priced if we're being you know completely honest for that market because yeah. when we look at the income data uh, from SARS and the number of people at sort of different uh, price points and the ability to even afford or qualify rather yeah. um, for right. you know property at certain price points, we know that 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 it's not possible because if we're talking lower end, it should at the very least be catering for the vast majority of you know working South Africans within a particular tax bracket. But unfortunately, that that's not uh, you know possible. So we we won't speak about the developers. You know they have their own agenda. Uh, and and why they would stick to to their guns, but Luther, I think let's let's look at then what the key factors that drive the real estate market is. I mean, this is one of those topics I love because you you, you look at the different factors. I mean, I do uh, real estate market analysis where you actually then look at the data and you justify that these are in fact the key drivers. You're not even talking about it right. from a hypothetical sense. What are some of those key drivers that uh, fundamentally drive the real estate sector? Yeah, yeah, um, that's that's a very good question. Thank you for that. Um, there's quite a number of them, um, but then I'll just like pick out um, just a few main ones, which I think uh, are really, really um, critical in, in driving the real estate market. So the first one would probably be um, your demand um, or as some other people would put it, the demographics, because um, when you're producing units, when you're building houses and, and building apartments, you're actually doing that for a particular group of people, right? So. Um, what you'd want to do firstly is to look at um, the general demographics of the area. Um, what kind of people are there? What is their affordability? And is there actually a demand for the units that you want to produce? So that's the first thing that you look at when you're um, looking at the real estate market. And then secondly, um, there's the economy, right? So um, you obviously want to know what the economic climate is. Um, and this varies from different um, geographical contexts, different countries, different cities, and different provinces as well. So you'd want to know what the economic climate is, and that can speak to um, the employment um, that's happening there, the economic activities, are people actually managing to generate an income which informs their affordability to actually purchase these units, or if it's in it's rental, or that they're able to afford the rentals um, in the rental market there. Um, and also within the economy, this kind of just is a good segue to get into the third, um, um, the third um, driver of the real estate market with interest rates. And um, interest rates are more particularly important because um, there's also lending and borrowing that is um, happening um, to create some flow within the real estate market. So um, take, for instance, if you are a developer and you want to produce some units, um, for the most part, you might get your finance through um, borrowing from maybe development finance institutions or other financial institutions, and then you use those finances to build. And if you're looking to buy a unit, a house uh, or an apartment, um, you might go through the way of uh, mortgage financing and you might want to borrow. And in, um, interest rates then play a critical role there in the pricing of, of these loans that people obtain to either build or to either buy um, housing units. And lastly, there's also government policy, which basically informs the um which informs the enabling environment so um, this basically speaks to whether the um the enabling environment is good enough to allow for these transactions to happen within the real estate market um so policy can either um be in the form of um, subsidies can also be in the form of taxation it can influence um, you know, state intervention when it comes to the real estate market. And it can also um, influence um, just what the general market is. So if, if state policy is uh, more liberal or like takes on a market um, free approach, then you kind of have an organic real estate market that just takes place on its own. But then sometimes you might have policy and legislation that just um, restricts um, organic market flow and has a lot of state intervention within it. So also, yeah, this this kind of 
how this is viewed is basically um, it could be different. You know, some people would probably want that more um, more state intervention, and um, other people may not really like that, and they would just want the market to grow organically and things to happen uh, on their own. But yeah, those four that I just mentioned are probably the more essential ones, and there could be others as well that um, people would see as very important. But these, yeah, these these are. Uh, also like a bit subjective matters but yeah those four i think are, are very critical when you're looking at the real estate market in in any geographical context yeah. this evening i'm in conversation with Luda Lujabe, who's a research manager at the center for affordable housing finance in africa looking at investment on the lower end of the housing market what the drivers are um, and of course some of the key th- factors that uh, you need to be looking out for in the event where you want to invest in that particular uh, sector. You know, one of the things that you're, you're mentioning was, of course, we look interest rates are quite a big driver. We saw yesterday um, the Reserve Bank governor, you know, we've, we've, we've seen another interest rate hike by 25 basis points. And a lot of the you know, experts have, have noted that we're going to see um, hikes f- pretty much for every meeting they're going to have this year um, with I think two two members of the MPC actually wanted uh, a 50 basis points hike so in, in many ways we're somewhat spared uh, by having it by 25 basis points so we know that the interest rate is not sitting at 7.5 percent we know that uh, that is quite a big driver and when we saw the historically low interest rates we did see quite a number of new players entering that first time home buying market because they simply couldn't afford it um, when interest rates were slightly higher. So it's a big factor for people. We always caution and I certainly always caution people that look, you don't want to, especially when you're an investment buyer, it's slightly different when you're buying a, a home to live in. As an investment buyer, you don't want to buy primarily because of low interest rates. Uh, that That's a terrible reason to buy. That needs to be part of a bigger strategy that you have in place. Because as we're seeing, interest rates are going up. And if you hadn't adequately budgeted for that, then you're going to feel the pinch quite significantly. And so when we look at at then the, the, the private sector and government, what would you say is the role that this that the, the that the state in particular or government plays um, in the private sector when it comes to making a affordable housing market or playing a role in the affordable housing market okay um yeah so the affordable housing market um is it's it's quite a a precarious one you know so mm-hmm. so the issue there is that um a lot of private sector players um, don't really want to invest in it. They don't want to participate in it because um, firstly, it's seen as not very profitable. And secondly, the margins are quite narrow in the affordable um, in the affordable housing sector. So, so with narrow margins, if anything goes wrong and along the value chain, then um, you're likely to incur loss. So, in order to stimulate um, some activity within the affordable housing sector, you then kind of need um, both the private sector and government to play a role in it. And then that's how you can kind of make it work. And um, in the developing world, a lot of countries um, seem to um, look to the state to try and make the affordable housing market work. But um, to be quite fair, it's almost impossible for for the states to take on that role on their own so now that's why you kind of have the two um the state and and private sector having a big role to play to make um affordable market um affordable markets work um so now the role that the state can play could um either be um one of multiple ways um the first one being um subsidies which is probably the most obvious one so in South Africa, we have the RDP, the BNG, and the finance-linked um, individual subsidy program, which is FLISP, which tries to um, provide subsidies for for houses and, and units that are still under construction so that um, they can be more affordable to the end user who, you know, when, you, when we're now at the stage of getting people inside homes. Um, so that's the one role they could play. Yes. Another um, role that the state could also play is actually working in partnership with um, with private sector, with private developers. And, and this could either be 
um, in the form of, um, oh, this is actually a good example, in the form of the state providing land. Um, we all know that um, in local government, um, there's um, large pockets of land that are owned by local government. And um, so another role the state could play is just releasing some of that land. So they provide the land and then developers, private sector developers come in and um, erect the top structures. And so those are how these public-private partnerships could possibly work. And so with the land being released by the state at subsidized prices or sometimes fully subsidized, like they, the land is released for free, um, that takes away some of the um, cost, to, particularly the, the, the cost of the land from the developer, which, um, and, and, that, and that, um, that price reduction in the land is then um, become, it becomes a benefit to, to the end user in the form of um, a price reduction because um, the total cost for the developer is less because they didn't pay for the land. Um, another way could also be um, um, just um, infrastructure delivery. So that's a, 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 the state, um, local government providing infrastructure on land. So that's uh, basically servicing the land, which takes away that um, cost from the developer, and then the developer then reduces their prices so that the end user um, gets a reduced price as well for that unit once once it's fully built. So this is um, private-public um, partnerships. And then also now, when you look at how private sector on their own could play a significant role in affordable housing, you could possibly look at things like... Um, um, them being cognizant of that uh, people who are low income earners, some of them earn a living informally. So what you get with conventional lenders is that if somebody is in the informal um, economic sector, informal job market, they are not necessarily, they're not really considered, you know, for, for finance and they wouldn't be um, they wouldn't be provided any loans to try and acquire um, homes. So um, just a, a more a more liberal understanding of that some people do earn a living, but it's probably in the informal in the informal sector and um, um, considering those people as well. So the housing microfinance is a way that the private sector is now doing it. So um, other financial institutions for non-banks are providing microfinance to people who are um, earning informally so that they could um, either purchase units or um, use self-build methods to um, incrementally build their own homes. So that's a, that's a big way in which um, in which the private sector could also play a role. And these are usually non-bank financial institutions that are doing that. So yeah, there's there's quite a, a number of ways that that um, both the state and private sector could play um, a role in making affordable housing finance work. And and I think if anything, Luda, the that's a great point to leave it at, that there's a lot of work to be done and both the private and the public sector need to come on board because this is one of those things that we cannot uh, not service and adequately service at that uh, in, 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 in when we, of course, address it because it's so important that uh, that market is serviced and is serviced well because the reality yeah. is the majority of South Africans are going to be the one that access uh, property at those price points. And so we need to make sure that we're catering to them as best as possible. Well, Luther, we're going to leave it there this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. All right. Thank you very much, Zama. And thank you for having me. And that is Luda Luchabe, who's a research manager at the Center for Affordable Housing Finance in Africa, closing up the Friday edition of the Private Property Podcast. It certainly has been a pleasure to be with you on this short, long week. Uh, I do hope that you'll enjoy your weekend and, of course, be tuned into the other great shows that we have uh, on our Facebook page. I'll be back on your screens on Monday evening at 7 p.m. as usual. Until then, hoping you're staying home and staying safe.